All right, good morning. How are you guys? Good. My name is DJ. I'm one of the pastors here for about another month. And um, I wanted to talk to you about the men's ste stepping up class real quick. Guys, let's just stand up real quick and practice. No, no one's doing it. Okay. Uh, anybody ever read a book or seen a book called uh, Why Men Hate Church? Any men want to raise their hand? <laughs> Sometimes church isn't the most man friendly. Can I get an amen for that? Isn't it true? Okay, wives, have you ever had to drag your man to church? <laughs> You're like not saying that loud because he's right next to you. Uh, anyway, sometimes the way we communicate in church isn't always dude friendly, correct? And so that's why we're doing this class, men stepping up. It's like a way to communicate to men on a level that men need, okay? So it's going to be this sun or Saturday, 8 to 4. It's a live simulcast. Lots of other people around the nation going to be in it. Fantastic teachers. Some of the favorite, pe the favorite people that I have to listen to are these guys. And so if you're a dude and you want to um, dig into God maybe more in a way that you can understand, I would really encourage you to come to that. Okay? All right. The second thing and last thing before we get going I wanted to do is I wanted to introduce my family to you. They're here from Nebraska. Could you guys stand up, please? David, stand up. Thank you, thank you. I just, in a lot of ways, I don't get to do this very often, all right? They're not here very often. In a lot of ways, what I do is because of you guys, and I'm so thankful. And so, it's, it's fun, yeah, it's so fun treat to have them. All right, let's pray and jump in. God, we're so grateful. Um, God, just for everything, uh, you have made everything about our lives possible. The, the breath that we breathe. Um, and then church today, uh, we're here not just to do some religious routine, but to connect with the living God. And so Holy Spirit, we invite your presence here. And we just ask God that you would uh, move in our lives, that you would speak through the truth that we talk about today, and that you would translate it to the core of who we are that we may be people that understand your gospel more, that we understand your love for us more, and uh, that we have a deeper relationship with you. So we just pray this in your name. Everybody said? Amen. All right. So today we are continuing on in our series in Genesis. Um, we have been sprinting through Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It's 50 chapters long. Guess what? We're at 47 today. <laughs> We're almost done. And uh, it's been a little bit over a year, so we've taken our time, but I think we've learned a lot. And uh, today we're going to talk about a guy named Joseph, okay? Joseph is, um, uh, he's quite the character. And today he's the second man in charge of Egypt. Before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Uh, maybe this is a question that you have wrestled with or, or just asked before. Um, I want to ask you this. How do you know to what quality or measure your relationship with God is? Like, how do you know how good you are following God? What are the standards or things which you like could point to to tell us that, right? Um, how close are you to God? When you go to heaven or, I mean, hopefully heaven today, someday, right? And when God lets you in those big pearly gates, how do you know what kind of house you're gonna get? Like, you know what I mean? Is it gonna be a little condo, like shack, apartment right at the opening? There's a mansion. Okay, that's not real. But <laughs> I just say, don't you ever wonder that? Like, how do I know how I'm doing with God? What are the things that we would judge to tell how good we're doing with God? Is it uh, reading our Bible? How, how many times I read my Bible this week? Should I do a little poll? Okay, who did seven days? No, I just don't do that. Right? Is it, uh, maybe it's that feeling we get at church during worship right? It's like, okay, I had four butterfly moments during the worship service. I think I'm pretty close to God right now. I mean, is that, is that how you know how close you are to God? Uh, maybe it's um, how often you come to church, right? Are you in the gold club, <laughs> right? Are you in the silver? Okay, there's no clubs like that either. Um, what, what, is there a concrete way to tell you um, how you're doing with God? And the Bible would say yes. 
Today we're going to talk about it. I really think the Bible gives us very clear, very tangible, very concrete way to say, I can point to and see exactly how I'm doing in my relationship with God, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about with Joseph because Joseph shows us how this works. Okay, so Joseph was a guy that loved God. And because he loved God, Pharaoh saw that there was something different about him. And so Pharaoh made him in charge of Egypt. Okay, so Joseph is now a big deal. And what happened in this time in Egypt is kind of what has happened in America, right? There was seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine, right? The stock market crashed. And so we got Joseph trying to figure out what to do to manage it all. And so what we see in this is Joseph has been really, really smart about these years of abundance and he has saved a ton of food. Okay, and so what happens is all the people in Egypt who didn't live by that principle, right? When they had a lot, what did they do? They gorged themselves. They lived it up. They partied every night, right? Well, now they're out of money and they're coming to Joseph trying to figure out what to do. Okay, Genesis 47, verse 15. Here we go. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. So Joseph could have responded two ways. He's got everybody begging him for what he's got, right? He could have jacked the prices and said, oh, you want some food, huh? Well, a cheeseburger is 10 bucks. And that's the, you know, that's the base cheeseburger at McDonald's, you know? And if you want to drink with that, that's another, right? He could have done that. Or he could have said, wow, these people need something. And I have what they need. Maybe I can take care of them. Here's what he says. Verse 16, Joseph answered, okay, well, give your livestock and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. Now, this is really interesting. You would think this is a good deal for Joseph, right? It's not. Food is worth more in this culture that we're talking about here. Food is worth more than money. It's worth more than life. It's worth more than land because nobody has it. So food is the most valuable economy, right? And, and check it out. Anybody a farmer in here? Anybody have animals? What do you have to do with them in relation to food? Feed them. And so he's inheriting all these animals that nobody wants. And he's got to feed them with this valuable, valuable food, right? But he does it anyway. And so he does that and they eat for a year, but they come back the next year. So skipping verse Ahead to six to 19, sorry. Why should we die before your eyes? Both we and our land, this is them talking to Pharaoh, buy us and our land for food. And we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Okay, now they're coming to us. You ever heard the principle, teach a man to, no. Give a man a fish. Thank you. I have it in my notes. <laughs> Give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. Right? They're coming back to Pharaoh or to Joseph and they're saying, this is not working. We're, we're not getting any richer. Our land is desolate. We don't have any livestock anymore. Literally all we have is our land and us. And so they're saying, we'll sell ourselves to you to eat. But let's do more than that. They say, give us food. They're, they're begging him to be generous. And so Joseph said to the people, behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now there is seed for you and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest, you shall give a fifth to the Pharaoh, fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and as food for yourselves and for your households. And as for food for your little ones. He even mentions the little ones. That's pretty cool. I really just saw that. Um, I think this is huge. You may still think this is a bad deal for the Israelites, or I'm sorry, some of the Israelites, mostly for the Egyptians, right? You may think this is a bad deal for them. Check this out. This is like me saying, okay, I'm going to give you land in Palisade that has peaches, and it didn't freeze this year and ruin them, and you can harvest, work the land, work really hard. I'll give you food in the meantime. And then when the harvest comes, all you have to do is give me one fifth and you get to keep four fifths. Would anybody here do that deal? Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. Anybody know anything about taxes? 
Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be nice if our taxes were only 20%, right? I mean, check that out. That's what he's saying. He is being generous. So he's flipping the coin and saying, you know what? I could just make you my slaves and I could have you work this land, right? Because four fifths for a slave, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? And so that's what he does. He gives generously to these people. And they said, here's how they responded. You have saved our lives. May it please the Lord. We will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statue considering the land of Egypt. And it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have a fifth of the produce. So skipping to 27. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen. And they gained great possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. So what we see here is that Joseph is incredibly generous. And in that generosity, he, was, he allowed the Jews to live. And this is just as God had said, right? Joseph was uh, Abraham's grandson. And, and if you remember, we talked about this a while ago, but in Genesis 12, two and three, God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Well, let me read it. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And check this out. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, God, from the beginning, when he saw Abraham and said, you are gonna be my chosen person of this world, he specifically said, I'm going to bless you so that my name will be great throughout the earth. All right, do we see that? There's this blessing that he gets, but then that blessing is inextricably tied to the giving of that blessing, right? And this is gonna be absolutely huge in what we see because Joseph saw that he was blessed, that God had given him all of this power and position in Egypt, but instead of pointing it to himself, he pointed it out, okay? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's look at three points that I see as really critical or crucial points of this text. Okay, the first three things of the three things we see is that God has blessed us to be a blessing. All right, if you like to take notes, you can write these down. I think they'll be on the screen. And um, that's, that's what we're going to do. So Joseph, he was blessed because God had positioned him there to continue the line um, of the line of God. 2 Corinthians says it this way, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in a triumphal possession. Possession. Wouldn't we just like to stop there? Thanks be to Christ who always makes everything awesome for us. He continues. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Right? You see this? He is blessing us, leading in triumphal procession so that we can lead his fragrance, his blessing to others. He says it so well in verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The aroma, the smell, right? Other scripture talks about us being the light of God, right? Literally this idea that when the kingdom of God comes into our life, just our very presence moving forward breeds this sort of, this aroma, this smell of God's kingdom. And so we've talked about this a little bit. Vanessa and I are going to plant a church in Durango. We move in August, so it's coming up quick. So we've been thinking a lot about what are we going to do in Durango to build a church, right? Everybody's been asking us, do you have a building yet? And I respond, no, because we don't have any people. You don't need a building when you don't have people, right? Right. And so, so as we've thought about it, we've thought about this idea that the kingdom of God is in us and we are going to spread that kingdom of God. And this Venn diagram has really helped us understand God's kingdom. Now let me move it up here so we can all see it. Okay, a Venn diagram, the idea is we always want to be in the middle, but we usually find ourselves being linked to a side or just in one. Okay, when the kingdom of God comes in our life, he comes in three ways. Um, the gospel. The gospel is the idea that we are sinners saved by Jesus. Unbelievable, ridiculous, and lavish love for us. Okay? And, and so the gospel is the truth of Christ. Um, the second is love or community. When, when God came, he's the, when Jesus came, he's the only one that's ever said things like, love your enemies. 
right? He's the only one that said, give your life for the betterment of others. He's the only one that said, here's what all of the law says. Love God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so love is a huge part of the kingdom. And then, and then our stuff or mission, right? When Jesus left, he said, I give you one thing to do. Go out into the whole world and preach the gospel. Baptize people, tell them about who I am, right? And so as we're going to Durango, we've sort of thought of God's kingdom in the idea that usually we tend towards one side or the other, right? And so if you're a gospel person, and maybe a love person together, right? You love people and you love the gospel. What happens in this corner is we can turn into pup puppies licking each other. That's what I like to call it, right? It's like we sit around and we do these Bible studies, but they're just for ourselves, And we like love each other. Oh, you're so awesome. And isn't God so awesome? And this is so great, right? Um, in this other side, we can do the love and missional thing. This is, I like to call this social justice, which is good, right? This is building wells in Africa and this is saving people and this is doing good things. But when it's missing the most powerful name and the only name that gives us something beyond this life, right? Then it's, in a, it's, it's, it's uh, temporary, right? And so social justice by itself isn't good enough. And then if we do the gospel and mission well together, you're like those people that uh, are street preachers, right? Bullhorn man yelling at people. Hey, you need to love Jesus. He loves you. Dang it. Like, are you sure? Because it doesn't sound like it, right? I mean, these are the people, right, that instead of leaving a tip at a restaurant, they leave a track. They're like, because it's really going to help you, okay? You're going to know Jesus through this, and, right? And you're just like, you're missing it, right? Because the goal in the kingdom of God is to marry all of these three things. Right? And so we're, as we're talking about being the aroma of Christ, like being the aroma is more than just talking about Jesus. It's more than just loving people. And it's more than just giving our stuff. But today we're going to talk and focus because of Joseph's life a lot on our stuff. Okay? So Galatians 3.9 talks about the gospel and how it's linked. It's married with re giving and receiving, receiving and giving, okay? So check this out. I think this is phenomenal, all right? Galatians 3, 9, and, and the scripture, for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the, the what? So this is the gospel. Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. What is he saying here? He's saying that the gospel is this combination of, I'm going to give you an identity, knowing that you are loved, forgiven by grace. And as I give that identity to you, you are going to bless and reach out to the world. And what he's saying is the gospel is both. And the problem is we like to separate those, don't we? Right? Sometimes we can get into this idea that the gospel is just coming to church and receiving from God when it's both. Here's what, I, here's what I think. We cannot amputate good works from the gospel, right? To, to not be generous is to miss the gospel. It's like an amputation, right? It's to cut off half of it, right? And Jesus spoke about this a lot. Right? As, as you look through the scriptures, usually he told parables about it. One of my favorite ones is this parable where Jesus um, is talking to two, well, he's telling a story about two people that owed money. Okay? And one man owed the, what was about comparable of $12,000. And he owed that money to this man. And this man owed $6 billion to this man, okay? And this man, Jesus says, was just looking at his finances one day and realized, you know what? This whole payment plan with this dude that owes us a ton of money is not working. I've got enough. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna forgive him the debt. And so he goes to this guy that owes him $6 billion. That's, that's the actual what Jesus would have been saying. And, and this guy says, what, you're gonna forgive me all of this money? Are you serious? And so you know what he does to this guy with the debt? You know, at the first service, I said that, I left it like that. And a little kid in the front row, 
He goes, he forgave him. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Because he didn't. Right? That's the story that Jesus tells. What he says is, he goes at this man and he says, you need to pay me now. He sees it as an opportunity for personal gain. And so he goes to this guy, you need to pay me right now. The guy can't pay him. And he throws him in jail. And Jesus says, this guy figures out what this guy has done. And he just is absolutely mad. And he goes to this guy and he throws him in jail. Right? Basically, he's saying, Look at us, we are sinners. We are helpless without Jesus. Our natural inclination is diverted from the purpose that God had for us. And yet God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross, giving this unbelievable gift to us. And then if we receive this gift, how can we then to others cut them off from that generosity? That's what Jesus is saying. See, he's saying that the gospel is absolutely connected with getting and giving. They are one in the same. They're not separate things. So here's the funny thing about uh, giving, all right? Um, we think that if we get more stuff, it's going to be easy to give. Isn't that true? Right? So, so now if I just stopped here at this message, I think we'd all be praying, God, make me wealthy so I can give a lot of money away. Isn't that how it works? Because if I have a lot of stuff, then I'm much more likely to give generously. Eh, wrong, right? Jesus covers that one too. He said it's easier for a rich man to get into the kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Did I say that right? Backwards. It's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Are you serious, Jesus? Yeah, because when we have riches, we so easily can use that rich, those riches, start trusting in those riches and start using those riches to provide our identity rather than Jesus to provide our identity. Um, here's a really interesting thing. Um, I, I looked at states in the U.S. And, and just looked at a list of how these states are ordered as far as wealth and then how these states are ordered as far as generosity. Check this out. This is really interesting. Here's the top six states. Maryland, Alaska, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Sorry, Colorado didn't make it. <laughs> All right, these are the six most wealthy states in the union. All right, check this out. Now let's compare it to, compare it to their charitable giving. Maryland, number 10. Not too bad. By the way, this is percentage not total income, but this is percentage of giving, which really indicates how generous they are. All right, Maryland, number 10. Alaska, 28th most generous. New Jersey, 42nd most generous. Connecticut, 45th most generous. Massachusetts, 47th most generous. And New Hampshire, 50th most generous. If you think that getting money is going to make you generous, you're wrong. Jesus makes you generous. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Let's, let's check out the end. Let's, let's see how the poor ones are doing, okay? Number 45, Tennessee. Number 46, Alabama. Number 47, Tennessee, or Kentucky. Number 48, Arkansas. Number 49, West Virginia. And 40, or 50, Mississippi. I can't read today. Um, now, those are, so those are the poorest states. Let's check out how generous they are in the list. You ready? Tennessee. Fourth, Alabama, third, Kentucky, 15th, Arkansas, seventh, West Virginia, 38th. They got it wrong. Um, Mississippi, second. Isn't that unbelievable? We think, God, give us money. We, we want to be generous. We want to be blessed so we can bless the world. Wrong. The more we have, the less likely we are to be generous. Right? And, and Joseph got this. And I, I, in many ways, I think that's why God sent Joseph to jail. I don't know the theology of that, really. But because Joseph spent 14 years in jail, I really believe that he had this attitude about himself that, you know what? I don't need my identity to be found in my stuff, in what I'm doing, in my job. And so when he was elevated to power later by 
Pharaoh, he was actually able to not use that stuff to seek his identity, right? He got that he was blessed to be a blessing. All right, point two, our finances show, show our faithfulness, okay? You ready for a convicting quote? Wow, I can tell you guys are ready for this. <laughs> I wasn't either. Um, here we go, Christ's words, oh, sorry. This is by Randy Alcorn. This is a quote from one of his books on money. Christ's words are direct and profound. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. What we do with our possessions is a sure indicator of what's in our hearts. Jesus is saying, show me your checkbook, your credit card statement, and your receipts for cash expenditures, and I'll show you where your heart really is. What we do with our money doesn't lie. It's a bold statement to God of what we truly value. Uncomfortable? Anyone else? Right? Um, what do you like to spend money on? I, I like to spend money. And most recently, this week, I've been working on a Jeep project. I'm rebuilding an engine with my neighbor. He's the expert. I'm just the guy that I'm um, spending the money. And um, anyway, yeah, <laughs> Vanessa laughs. She's like, seriously, <laughs> It's, it's funny, in this project, um, I've had to decide all of the stuff that goes in the engine. And as you can imagine, every different level of thing costs more money, right? And so there's a thing called a camshaft in your engine, and you can get a really cheap one, or you can get an expensive one. And there's things called bearings in your engine, and you can get cheap ones or expensive ones, and on and on and on, pistons and the whole thing. And here's the funny one. I've been debating whether I should get this really cool upgraded water pump called a flow cooler, okay? Now this flow cooler, I don't know if I have any gear heads in here, but essentially what it's supposed to do is pump more antifreeze through your engine to keep it cooler because my engine's a little bit, you know, upgraded. It's got little performance things in it, okay? And so I've been looking into whether this for flow cooler is actually um, work or not because almost all the guys on the Jeep forum they get this thing, all right? This is an upgrade that they like to get. And so I'm like, I want that because they got it. And so anyway, I did some research. Guess what? Zero difference. Test after test after test have proved that this $150 water pump is worthless. Guess what? I still want to get it. <laughs> I'm serious. Why do I want to get it? I'll, I'll be really honest. I'll tell you why I want to get it. I want to get it because I want to put the flow cooler sticker on the back of my Jeep. Okay, I want to get it so that when I talk to like engine gearhead guys that know what they're talking about, I can be like, oh yeah, and it's got a flow cooler on it. <laughs> Why is that? It's because I find my identity, my acceptance in what I have, right? Here's how this works. We think, here's the thought process that goes on with money. We think that if I can have that, then I know I'll be somebody. All right, so what's it for you? For some people, it's clothing. If I look that way, then I'll, I know I'll be somebody. Maybe it's a real nice house. If, if I can just live in this neighborhood, then I know I'll be somebody. Maybe it's a car. If I can just drive this thing with the shiny wheels, then I will be somebody, right? And so here's the really interesting thing about money. Money Oh, I got one more that's really important for me to mention. Some of us don't like actually having a lot of stuff. We're on the other side. We are so absurdly frugal and we cannot be free with our money because for us, money's a control thing, right? We're control freaks. And we think if I have money, then I'll be somebody. If I got money in the bank, then I can make sure I'll be okay. Right? Here's the thing about money. Money is not an idol. Right? That's, that's a Christian-y word for like some, a treasure that we like more than God. Money is not an idol. Money points to our idols. Wherever we have an idol, there you will see money linked. It goes hand in hand. Did you know that? And, and so that's why he said earlier that if you look at your bank account, you can see what you're really trusting. Now, this is not a black and white thing, right? You're either heavenly or you're sinful, right? Like, 
all of us, aren't we all in this boat? Don't we all struggle with this? I like being generous. I like more to spend money on me, right? What does that show? It shows that I have things that create almost like identity holds for me. I have treasures that I treasure above Christ. And so here's the key. This is where it gets really cool when we start to see this. To the degree that your heart is free from these treasures is the degree that you will be able to be radically, lavishly generous. Right? Because if I don't need this treasure to make me look good to anybody, because Jesus has already said that I look good and I believe him and I walk around with that confidence, right? Then guess what? Oh, I got some extra money here. Oh, you know what? You probably need it. Here, I don't need it. Right? Do you see that? Because money isn't the thing that we crave. It's the thing that money can buy. And usually the thing that money can buy is in competition with the God of the universe that loves us and created us and, and really has offered us an identity that is longer than just this life and things that we can buy, right? And so to the degree that we are still enthralled with these things is the degree that you will be hampered in your ability to give. See, the gospel and giving are linked. Do you see that? They're absolutely one and the same thing. And so... That's why I said our finances show our faithfulness, right? And so check this out. Remember the question I asked at the beginning? How do you know how you're doing with God? Are you serious, DJ? You're telling me that my money tells me that? Have you seen me raise my hands in worship, right? It doesn't matter because your heart actually points out what you care about. Do you see that? Okay, now one thing that I just want to say to this group before we go on. This does not mean that we need to be guilty spenders, right? Again, if money's not an idol, then money can't be evil either. Having money, having stuff is not evil. It's part of life. But what we can do is if we don't have a guilt approach, if we just say, God, show me what my money shows in me, then we will start to see what is in competition with Jesus as our treasure. Okay, make sense? By the way, Joseph got this, didn't he? He got it so much so that when push came to shove, when he was in the chair, when he had the money, he was lavishly generous and able to, like the people were able to survive through him. Okay, last, last point. God's plan for the world is you. This is the neatest thing I think about scripture. That God is this unbelievably generous God that sent his son to die for us, to give us the greatest gift that we could ever have. And you know what? He chose us to be the ones that get to deliver that generosity to this world. Check this out. This is 2 Corinthians 9, 11. Uh, Paul says this, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us, We'll produce thanksgiving to God. Here's what he's saying. Do you want to produce worshipers of God? Then be generous to people. That's, that's literally what he's saying. He's saying, if you are generous with what you have, you will produce thankfulness to God. Isn't that exciting? That we actually get the chance to be the vehicle of God's love and lavish generosity to this world? Have you ever been generous to somebody and just saw that look in their eye? Like, what are you doing? It doesn't even make sense. Actually, better yet, have you ever had somebody be, to be so generous to you that you just could not explain or understand why they were doing that? That produces thankfulness to God. That, that produces, it's like, uh-huh, right? Let me tell you a couple of stories. There's a young man, Taylor, who's, um, who I've been spending time with. He's a recent Christian. He's, he's less than six months in following Jesus. His parents are right over here. So they, they know the whole story, right? And Taylor has been hanging out with this homeless guy, James, right? Um, Taylor uh, came to the Robbie Dawkins conference a couple weeks ago and, and just heard about how God loves everybody and that he, you know, essentially God wants to use us to love people in the world. And that night, he goes and meets this guy named James. He goes down, he finds this homeless guy, he buys him dinner. Then he doesn't stop there. He does it the next night. 
He does it the next week. He keeps doing it until finally last week he comes to me and he said, DJ, I'm running out of money. I'm serious. He's like, because he's just 18 and he's working for He's like, I don't have any money left because I keep giving it to this guy. And if he says he wants a pop, I give him a pop. And if he says he wants an upgrade, I give him, up, him an upgrade. What do I do? Right? He's so enthralled with loving this guy and being generous that he's just, he's got caught up in it. He's found joy in it. Let me, let me tell you another story. Kim and Chris, they go to church here. They live kitty corner from those two houses that burned down on 7th. You know the ones I'm talking about? And so the next day, they bake a plate of brownies and start taking it around to all the neighbors. Literally, they just, hey, uh, we just wanted to tell you we love you and that God loves you. And if there's anything we can do for you, um, please let us know. We live right over there. And we're so sorry for, you know, what's going on in your lives. Uh, last time I preached, there was uh, one of the girls that they had done this to. She came to church. She's like, yeah, this, it was crazy. These people, they just brought me brownies and told me they loved me and wanted to help me through the, the fire thing. And, and so now they're, she's going here. And, and I said, well, what do you think of church? She's like, I love it. I think it's awesome. I'm so glad I got invited. Isn't that great? Um, let, me, let me tell you about this. Uh, our church, we are a giving church. You know why we're a giving church? Because we believe that God loves us. We're not a giving church to prove anything or uh, try to put it on our resume. So when people visit here, we're like, look, you should come to our church. We give out sandwiches, right? (laughs) We don't do it for that. We do it because we know God loves us so much. And because God loves us much, we can't help but give out things. Check out, this is just this year alone. In Kimwood, uh, 1,950 people have come out to the park. 960 meals have been delivered to shut-ins. At Racket Club, 820 people have come out to park. 160 meals have been delivered to shut-ins. Backpacks. Anybody do backpacks here? Raise your hand. Gosh, you guys are saints. And like all saints, you raise your hands like this because you don't want to be noticed. Check this out. Every week, 620 kids receive a bag containing food for the weekend. Every week. That's 9,300 bags given to people through this church, through the backpack program. That's crazy. Why would we do that? Why would you guys spend your time doing that? Because Jesus loves you, right? Because the gospel says that you're a sinner saved by grace, not by works. And the best thing you can do is give it out to others, right? Um, I want to share one more story that's linked to this idea of thankfulness. Um, Last week, I was hanging out in Palisade, right? This campus in Palisade is going awesome. And after service, this um, lady that we know, her name's Melody. She comes up to me and she said, I think I have something really crazy to tell you. And I was like, okay. She's like, are you okay with crazy? And I'm like, I'm a Christian. (laughs) Like, yes. (laughs) And, And so she said, well... Gosh, you were, you were talking about Durango, and um, I really felt, okay, before I tell you this, because this is, i got to tell in the right order. Um, we're moving to Durango, right? And there's three things that we felt like we needed to get in order before we got there. Our computer is old, so we had to do some upgrading. So we bought some RAM and stuff. Um, our uh, Vanessa is going to road bike in Durango because it's a a great form of exercise and a great way to reach out to the community. So we were looking for a road bike and found one on Craigslist, unbelievably cheap. It was like totally, as they say, a God thing, right? And then the third thing is we wanted a little bike trailer for our kids, all right? And so we've been looking on Craigslist, you know, the kind you pop behind your bike and you ride around town. There's this great walking trail in Durango and a lot of people there and we want to connect to people through that. And so anyway, this has been on our radar. We've been researching and looking on Craigslist. So she comes up to me. This is crazy. Okay, whatever. And she goes, do you have a bike trailer? And I was like, no. And, and I was like, where's this going? You know? And she said, well, I felt like God told me I was supposed to buy you a bike trailer. And I was like, what? Are you serious? I was like, no, 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 no. And, and so I told her the story. And she's like, oh, that's awesome. That day. She calls me. She's like, we're 10 minutes from your house. And I've got a bike trailer. It was the last one at Brown. So we snatched it up really quick. I was like, no way. That's awesome. And so I'm thinking, man, Melody's awesome. I was driving to Durango last Sunday. And so I'm driving. And I will never forget this spot that I was in the road. 
all of a sudden it clicked. It dawned on me. And I asked God, I said, God, do you really love me that much? God's the only one that knows. And uh, God doesn't audibly speak very often, but I feel like God said, yes. And I, I guess I'm driving down the road and I'm like, I should pull over. Like, <laughs> God, you're so good. I can, why are you so good to me, right? Because that is what generosity does in people. Do you see it? Do you see it? It's not about trying to give money because you should feel guilty because all your stuff is God's and he wants it all. Actually, I have two quotes for you. Some of you have been listening to this service and there's just been this thing tumbling in you because you're cynical of the church and you believe that the church is always after your money. And so you're like, oh, they're talking about money again. I got two quotes for you. All right, Andy Stanley said this, Jesus doesn't want to take your stuff. He just doesn't want your stuff to take you. Right? Here's what Tim Keller said. All other treasures will demand that you do anything to get them. Jesus Christ is the one treasure that will do anything to get you. Right? And so if you want to leave from here and you're like, man, I want to be generous. That would be awesome. I need to do this. I want those stories. Well, what do you do? Do you start thinking, okay, I, I got to force myself to give. I need to put 20 bucks in the offering plate next week. I need, to, I need to work really hard to do it. Is that what you do? No, here's what you do. You find out how much God loves you. That's what you do. That's where giving comes from. If you know how radically and lavishly Jesus loves you and pursues you and thinks the world of you, if you have your identity totally tied in him, it is gonna be easy to be generous. And so that's our challenge today. That's where we go from here is God, love me. God, speak to me. God, show me what you think of me. And then guess what? We're gonna find generosity following, all right? So let's stand. And as we worship, we're singing this great song. It's called In Christ Alone. I just want you to simply ask, don't think about generosity or what you can give. Just simply ask, God, show me how much you love me.